Hey Style Academy writers, welcome to this video on participles. Participles are a great modifier that are really useful in a lot of genres of writing and uh, we're excited to show you what they're all about in this video. Let's start by looking at an expert. This is uh, Suzanne Collins. This is from The Hunger Games. Give this little excerpt a read and while you're reading it, pay attention to what you notice in terms of the techniques that Collins uses to make her writing come alive. So what did you notice? I hope that you picked up on these phrases that are all over the writing here and that give the writing that Suzanne Collins is doing this, this kind of motion, this movement. Um, these are examples of participles or participials actually, which is kind of a broader term for participles. If you take a look at some of these, you'll notice a pattern. Here's landing on my back, waiting motionless for game to wander by, and struggling to inhale, to exhale, to do anything. You'll see that all of these start with similar words at the beginning. In other words, landing, waiting, struggling. Notice how these all end in ing. Now that's one of the first signs that they're participles. Participles are these verbish kinds of words that end in ing or ed and they act like adjectives when we put them in the writing. So in other words, they modify nouns. They're sort of like genetic descendants of verbs, but they're not really verbs because they can't stand on their own as verbs. They're modifiers and they modify nouns just like adjectives. And they end in ing or ed. Because they have this verbal kind of parentage, they tend to give our writing some kind of action, a sense of motion and things happening. And that's where their real power comes in. Let's take a look at something else about participles here. Here's the sentence the way Suzanne Collins originally wrote it. Notice how the participial phrase, because it's a bunch of words, the participial phrase comes at the end of this sentence. Now, we, she could have written this sentence a couple of different ways, or maybe even more than this. But pause the video and read these three sentences on your own and think about the difference. Like, what's the effect of each of these? And how are the, do the choices in different structures create a different effect? What do you see here? One thing I hope you see is that the way Suzanne Collins originally wrote the sentence is more concise than the other two alternatives. It's shorter, fewer words. That's one of the great things about participles and participial phrases is they allow us to convey the same kind of information but with fewer words, so our sentences are tighter. I also want you to notice here that when we use a participial phrase in the way Suzanne Collins has especially, we sort of create this simultaneity. I fell 10 feet on the ground, boom, and I landed on my back. I mean, it's sort of like the one is happening congruent with the other. Now, I know physically in space and time and all that, that really couldn't happen. But there is some sort of continuous motion that's created by using a participle. And these other two structures don't really allow for that. Let's take a look at another author using participles and participial phrases. Here's Ernest Hemingway. Pause the video, read this excerpt, see if you can identify the participles and the participial phrases, and make some notes about what effect they have. Okay, were you able to identify these participles and participial phrases that I've put here in orange? That little word there, submerged, might have tripped you up, might not have noticed it right off, but it is a participle. What I want you to notice about the participles here and the way Hemingway uses them, look how most of his sentence actually looks like it's made of participles, right? But they provide this sense, again, of motion, action, things happening in a concise way. That's important. But notice, too, the way that the participles sort of set a stage or a backdrop against which the main clause idea, in this case, he washed his hand in the ocean and held it there, that action takes place against this backdrop of all the participles and the participial phrases. It's a pretty cool technique and it works really powerfully in writing like this to help build that scene and to give us a whole sort of sweep over what's going on. 
Now, that's Hemingway, that's fiction. Let's take a look at another genre of writing here. Here's a New York Times book review article. This is nonfiction, informational kinds of writing. Again, pause the video, see if you can identify the participial phrases in this sentence that I've excerpted. Did you identify these that I've put in orange? The first one might have tripped you up a little bit because we've kind of got credited. That's not the first word of the phrase. There's another um, modifier in front of it right there. And it has a clause in it too with its own little verb, but it's participial. And so we have a participle at the end too. Again, notice kind of like Hemingway that the participles seem to be the bulk of this sentence in terms of just the number of words. But I think what I want you to notice here about these participles, especially in this nonfiction piece of writing, is how they introduce critical ideas, important ideas, to the sentence. And because they're participles, it's a concise, economic way of bringing in an important idea. So at the beginning here, Hinton has this real pedigree with young adult literature, and the author's trying to connect to that. At the end, you get some really important commentary in this final participial phrase about her impact on a generation of readers. So these are, these are participles that are used in really powerful ways in multiple genres. I hope you can see that in these examples. Okay, so now that you've seen other people writing with participles, let's try it on our own here. Let's do some exercises. I'm going to start by showing you a picture. This is an image that comes out of the archive of the Great Depression photos. And here's a real simple sentence. The man waited for the wind to cease. That's it, right? Now, how could we make this sentence better with some participles or participial phrases? An easy thing to do would be this. We just add a participle. Tired in front of man. So now we got a tired man. Not just any man, but a tired man. Okay, there's a participle. Comes from the verb to tire. Ends in the ed. Great. We could probably do better than that though, right? Let's try adding a whole phrase. Clinging desperately to his hat. Now here's a participial phrase that gives the man some action. He's doing something while he's waiting for the wind to cease. That enhances the imagery of what we've got going on in the original sentence. Now, if one participial phrase is good, why not throw in two, yeah? This is what that might look like. Here our participial phrases are struggling to hold his ground and clinging desperately to his hat. You can see, I hope, how both of these participial phrases add that imagery, add that motion or that movement. They give us a sort of backdrop against which the main clause or the action of the main clause takes place. I want you to notice something more about participial phrases and we're going to focus on this sentence right here with just a single participial phrase. When I wrote it this way, I chose to have the participial phrase as my opener to lead the sentence. I did that because I want this to be the opening shot, the image that gets established first in the reader's mind before we move on to the main clause action. Now, I could have structured the sentence differently. For instance, I could have had my participial phrase be an interrupter. In this case, interrupting and sitting between the noun and the verb of my main clause or my independent clause. This gives the sentence a different effect. First, the reader sees the man, and then the reader sees this action of clinging desperately to a hat. Now, I've got an opener, I've got an interrupter, and if you remember our video about manipulating sentence parts, you're going to be able to guess what comes next. I could put my participial phrase as the closer and have that participial phrase or that image of the participial phrase be what lingers with the reader as he or she moves on to the next sentence. Participial phrases are what I call portable. They can usually move around quite a bit in the sentence. And that's a cool thing for you to play with as a writer. Here's one last thing for you to pay attention to. Note how my punctuation changes when I move the participial phrase around in my sentence. If it's in the opening position or the closing position, usually we're going to set that participial phrase off with a single comma. If we have it as an interrupter, often, again, we're going to set it off with two commas. Okay, 
You ready to try this on your own? Here's another image, again, picture from the Great Depression archives. And I've got some simple, generic sentences over here on the right. For this exercise, I want you to take one of the sentences on the right here and enhance the imagery of the sentence by adding a participial phrase, or maybe two. You might also try playing around with the position of the participial phrase. How do your results look? I hope you're happy with them. Here's a couple of examples that I came up with. As you look at these and as you look at your own, one of the things I hope you see is how we can use participles to focus on little details, little actions, little movements, or sometimes big movements that are really important to the sentence, that enhance the main idea, the main clause. But I also hope you notice how we can do that in really concise ways. That's part of the power of the participle. That's the only exercise I have for this video. If you haven't tried adding some participles to the other two sentences, I'd strongly suggest you go back and do that. The more you practice with these, the more you'll develop a sense for their power and their potential in your sentences. Good luck with participles in your writing.